This week we're going to talk about inventory and the cost of goods sold. Merchandise inventory is the heart of a merchandising business and cost of goods sold is the most important expense for a company that sells goods rather than services. Gross profit or gross margin is the difference between net sales and cost of goods sold. This covers chapter covers the accounting for inventory and cost of goods sold. It also shows you how to analyze financial statements. In this chapter, we'll focus on inventory, cost of goods sold, and gross profit. So let's show how we account inventory. The basic concept of accounting for merchandise inventory can be illustrated with an example. Suppose a furniture store has in stock three chairs that cost $300 each. The furniture store marks the chairs up by $200 and sells two of the chairs for $500 each. The furniture store's balance sheet reflects the one chair that the company still holds in inventory. The income statement reports the cost of the two chairs sold as above. So at the end of the period, we can see from the partial balance sheet reflected that we have an inventory balance of $300. If we go to the partial income statement, we see reflected the sales generated as a result of selling two chairs at $500 and the cost of goods sold for those two chairs at $300 apiece to get us to a gross profit of $400. The basic concept of how we identify inventory, the asset, from cost of goods sold, the expense is shown above. The cost of the inventory sold shifts from asset to expense when the seller delivers the goods to the buyer. Note the difference between the sale price of inventory and the cost of inventory in our example. Sales revenue is based on the sale price of the inventory sold, which was $500 per chair. Cost of goods sold is based on the cost of the inventory sold, which is $300 per chair. Inventory on the balance sheet is based on the cost of the inventory still on hand at $300 per chair. Gross profit, also called gross margin, is the excess of sales revenue over cost of goods sold. It's called gross profit because operating expenses have yet to be subtracted. The number of inventory units on hand is determined from the accounting records backed up by physical count of goods at year end. Companies do not include in their inventory any goods they hold on consignment because these goods belong to another company. But they do include their own inventory that is out on consignment and held by another company. Consigned goods are always reported in the accounting records of the company that owns them, regardless of where they are physically being held for sale. Companies include inventory in transit from suppliers or in transit to customers that, according to shipping terms, legally belongs to them as of the year end. Shipping terms, otherwise known as FOB or free on board terms, indicate who owns the good at a particular point in time and therefore who must pay for the shipping cost. When the vendor invoice specifies FOB shipping point, the most common business practice, legal title to the goods pass from the seller to the purchaser when the inventory leaves the seller's place of business. The purchaser therefore owns the goods while they are in transit and must pay the transportation cost and insurance. In the case of goods purchased FOB shipping point, the company purchasing the goods must include goods in transit from suppliers as units and in inventory as of the end of the year. In the case of goods purchased FOB destination, the title to the goods does not pass from the seller to the purchaser until the goods arrive at the purchaser's receiving dock. Therefore, these goods are not counted in year and in inventory of the purchasing company. Rather, the cost of these goods is included in inventory of the seller until the goods reach their destination. There are two main types of inventory accounting systems, the periodic system and the perpetual system. The periodic system is used for inexpensive goods. A fabric store or a lumber yard won't keep a running record of every bolt or fabric of fabric or every two by four. Instead, these stores count their inventory periodically or at least once a year to determine the quantities on hand. Businesses such as restaurant and hometown nurseries also use the periodic system because the accounting cost of a periodic system is low. A perpetual inventory system uses computer software to keep a running record of inventory on hand. 
This system achieves control over goods such as furniture, automobiles, jewelry, apparel, and other types of inventories. Most businesses use the periodic, the perpetual inventory system. Let me say that again. Most businesses use the perpetual inventory system. When you check out of a store, the clerk scans the barcodes on the labels of the item you buy. Suppose you are buying a desk lamp from a furniture store. The barcode on the product label holds a lot of information. The optical scanner reads the barcode and the computer rec records the sale and updates the inventory records. All accounting systems record each purchase of inventory. When a company makes a sale, two entries are needed in the perpetual system. The company records the sale debits, cash, or accounts receivable, and credit sales revenue for the sales price of the good, and the company also debits cost of goods sold and credits inventory for the cost of the inventory sold. The journal entries to record inventory transactions are shown above. All amounts are assumed. When inventory is purchased, the inventory account is increased. When inventory is sold, the inventory account is decreased. Notice that there are two entries for the sale. The first is at the selling price and the second is at cost. These amounts too are assumed, but continuing the example from the previous page, the T accounts for inventory and cost of goods sold are shown with the journal entries posted. The beginning balance of inventory is assumed. So this is just an example, and if you walk through where the numbers are coming from and where they're going, you'll see the relationship between these two. And then, and then based on this, the resulting balance sheet and income statements are also shown. The first entry to inventory in the previous examples summarize a lot of detail. The cost of the inventory, $560,000, is the net amount of purchases determined as above. Freight in is the transportation cost paid by the buyer under terms FOB shipping point to move goods from the seller to the buyer. Freight in is accounted for as part of the cost of inventory. A purchase return is a decrease in the cost of inventory because the buyer returned the goods to the seller or the vendor. A purchase allowance also decreases the cost of inventory because the buyer got an allowance or a deduction from the amount owed. These terms are the flip side of the seller's re sales return and sales allowance. To document approval of purchase returns, management issues a debit memorandum, meaning that accounts payable are reduced or debited for the amount of their return. The offsetting credit is to inventory as the goods are shipped back to the seller or vendor. Purchase discounts and allowances are usually documented on the final invoice received from the vendor. A purchase discount is a decrease in the buyer's cost of inventory earned by paying quickly. Many companies offer payment terms of 2 slash 10 net 30. This means the buyer can take and the seller grants a 2% discount for payment within 10 days, with the full amount due in 30 days, if the buyer chooses not to pay early. Another common credit Net sales are computed exactly the same as net purchases, but with no freight in. Freight out paid by the seller under shipping terms FOB destination is not part of the cost of inventory. Instead, freight out is a delivery expense. It's the seller's expense of delivering merchandise to customers. And so next we want to apply and compare various inventory cost methods. Inventory is the first asset for which a manager can decide which accounting method to use. The accounting method selected affects the profits to be reported, the amount of income tax to be paid, and the values of the ratios derived from the financial statements. Determining the cost of inventory is easy when the unit cost remains constant, but the unit cost usually changes. For example, prices often rise. To compute, cost of goods sold and the cost of ending inventory still on hand, we must assign unit costs to the items. Accounting uses four generally accepted inventory methods. Specific unit cost, average cost, FIFO or first in, first out, and then LIFO or last in, first out. A company can use any of these methods since they are all permitted under generally accepted accounting principles. These methods can have very different effects on reported profits, income taxes, and cash flows. Therefore, companies select their inventory method with great care depending on their profit and cash flow objectives. One particular fact that should be emphasized is that the company doesn't have to actually sell the items in the same order that costs are removed from the inventory to cost of goods sold. The inventory flow 
chosen is only for the way that the cost will be assigned to the income statement and is not a representation of actual units sold, except in the case of the specific unit method. Some businesses deal in unique inventory items, such as automobiles, antique jewelry, or antique furniture, jewels, and real estate. These businesses cost their inventories at the specific cost of the particular unit. The specific cost unit method is also called the specific identification method. This method is too expensive to use for inventory items that have common characteristics, such as bushels of wheat, gallons of paint, or, or auto tires. So we cost to, we recognize as a cost of goods sold and relieve the inventory for the specific cost of the specific units that are sold. And that's what specific unit cost does. If we use the average cost method, sometimes called the weighted average method, it's based on the average cost of inventory during the period. The average cost per unit is calculated by dividing the cost of goods sold available by the number of units available. Cost and units available is found by summing the beginning inventory plus purchases. This average cost per unit is multiplied by the number of units sold then to determine cost of goods sold and by the number of units on hand to determine ending inventory. Under the FIFO method, the first cost in, in, into inventory are the first cost assigned to cost of goods sold, hence the name first in, first out. Under FIFO, the cost of ending inventory is always based on the latest cost incurred. Under LIFO, last in, first out, costing is the opposite of FIFO. Under LIFO, the last cost in, in, into into inventory go immediately to cost of goods sold. Under LIFO, the cost of ending inventory is always based on the oldest cost. When inventory unit costs change, the various inventory methods produce different cost of goods sold figures and therefore gross profit and net income amounts as well. On the balance sheet, the amount of inventory would also differ. When inventory prices are increasing, FIFO will result in the lowest cost of goods sold because it consists of older, less expensive costs. This results in a higher gross profit and higher net income. On the balance sheet, FIFO results in a higher inventory balance because it represents the more recent and costly purchases. For LIFO, cost of goods sold is highest because it is based on the more extensive recent costs where costs are rising. This results in a lower gross profit and net income. On the balance sheet, LIFO represents a lower inventory amount because it is made up of older, less expensive items. While inventory prices are de when inventory prices are decreasing, FIFO will result in the highest cost of goods sold because it consists of older yet more expensive costs. This results in a lower gross profit and lower net income. On the balance sheet, FIFO results in a lower inventory balance because it represents recent and less costly purchases. For LIFO, cost of goods sold is lowest because it is based on the less expensive recent cost. This results in higher gross profit and net income. On the balance sheet, LIFO results in a higher inventory amount because it is made up of older, more expensive items. The Internal Revenue Service requires all U.S. companies to use the same method of pricing inventories for tax purposes that they use for financial reporting purposes. Thus, the choice of inventory methods directly affects income taxes, which must be paid in cash. When prices are rising, LIFO results in the lowest taxable income and thus the lowest income taxes. This is the most attractive feature of LIFO, low income tax payments which is why about one-third of all companies use LIFO. During periods of inflation, companies can justify it may switch to LIFO for its tax and cash flow purposes. So let's compare the FIFO and LIFO inventory methods from a couple of different standpoints. When measuring cost of goods sold, how well does each method match inventory expense cost of goods sold against revenue? LIFO results in the most realistic net income figure because LIFO assigns the most recent inventory cost to expense. 
In contrast, FIFO matches old inventory cost against revenue, a poor measure of expense. FIFO income is therefore less realistic than LIFO income. When measuring ending inventory, which method reports the most up-to-date inventory cost on the balance sheet? And that's FIFO. LIFO can value inventory at very old cost because LIFO leaves the, leaves the oldest prices in ending inventory. So LIFO allows managers to manipulate net income by timing their purchases of inventory. When inventory prices are rising rapidly and a company wants to show less income for tax purposes, managers can buy a large amount of inventory near the end of the year. Under LIFO, these high inventory costs go straight to cost of goods sold. As a result, net income is decreased. When LIFO is used and inventory quantities fall below the level of the previous period, the situation is called LIFO liquidation. To compute cost of goods sold, the company must dip into older layers of inventory costs. Under LIFO and when prices are rising, that action shifts older, lower costs into cost of goods sold. The result is higher net income. Managers try to avoid LIFO liquidation because it increases income taxes. IFARs, or the International Financial Reporting Standards, also do not permit the use of LIFO, although they do permit LIFO and I'm sorry, permit FIFO and other methods. When U.S. GAAP and IFARs are fully integrated in a few years, U.S. companies that use LIFO will be forced to convert their inventory pricing to another method. So now let's explain and apply underlying GAAP for inventory. Several accounting principles have special relevance to inventories, such as consistency, disclosure, and representational faithfulness. The disclosure principle holds that a company's financial statements should report enough information for outsiders to make informed decisions about the company. The company should report relevant and representational faithful information about itself. That means proper di properly disclosing inventory accounting methods as well as the substance of all material transactions impacting the existence and proper valuation of inventory using comparable methods from period to period. The financial statements typically contain a footnote describing the inventory pricing method used as well as the fact that inventory was valued at the lower of that method or market. Without knowledge of the accounting method and without clear, complete disclosures in the financial statements, a banker could make an unwise lending decision. Suppose the banker is comparing two companies, one using FIFO and the other using, I'm sorry, one using LIFO and the other using FIFO. The FIFO company reports higher net income, but only because it uses FIFO. Without knowing this, the banker could loan money to the wrong business. And so the lower of cost or market rule, abbreviated as LCM, is based on the principles of relevance and representational faithfulness. LCM requires that the inventory be reported in the financial statements at whichever is lower, the inventory's historical cost or its market value. Applied to inventory, market value generally means current replacement cost. That is, how much the business would have to pay now to replace its inventory. If the replacement cost of inventory falls below its historical cost, the business must write down the value of its goods to market value, which is the most relevant and representationally faithful measure of its true worth to the business. The business reports ending inventory at its LCM value on the balance sheet. If the market value of inventory above cost is above cost, no adjustment is made for LCM. So now let's talk about how to compute and evaluate gross profit margin and inventory turnover. So gross profit, which is sales minus cost of goods sold, is a key indicator of a company's ability to sell inventory at a profit. Merchandisers strive to increase gross profit percentage, also called the gross margin percentage. Gross profit percentage is marked up stated as a percentage of sales. The gross profit percentage is watched carefully by managers and investors. A company strives to sell its inventory as quickly as possible because the goods generate no profit until they're sold. And in fact, inventory costs us, if we're having to finance inventory, it costs us to hold it and we run the risk that it becomes obsolescent. So the faster the sales, the higher the income and vice versa for slow-moving goods. 
Ideally, a business could operate with zero inventory, but most businesses, especially retailers, must keep some goods on hand. Inventory turnover, the ratio of cost of goods sold to average inventory, indicates how rapidly inventory is sold. Inventory turnover varies from industry to industry. The inventory turnover statistic shows how many times the company sold or turned over its average level of inventory during the year. Inventory turnover varies from industry to industry, which again points to um, the importance of when we calculate these ratios, we don't accept them on face value. We must compare them to uh, comparable firms in similar industries to understand and to get a real picture of whether our ratio is favorable or unfavorable. And so now we're going to use the cost of goods sold model to make management decisions. This table represents the cost of goods sold model. Some may view this model as related to the periodic inventory system, but the cost of goods sold model is used by all companies regardless of their accounting system. The model is extremely powerful because it captures all of the inventory information for an entire accounting period. And so the cost of goods sold model simply takes the beginning inventory, it adds to it any purchases we made over the period to get us to the cost of goods sold available for sale, and then it reduces that amount for ending inventory, which is what we still have sitting in our inventory that hasn't been sold, to get us to the cost of goods sold, which we then reduce revenues by in order to get to gross margin. So what is the single most important question for a retailer to address? What merchandise should the company offer to its customers? This is a marketing question that requires market research. If retailers continually stock up on the wrong merchandise, sales will suffer and profits will drop. What's the second most important question for a retailer? And that's how much inventory should it buy? This is an accounting question faced by all merchandisers. If a company buys too much merchandise, it will have to lower prices. The gross profit percentage will suffer and the company may lose money. Buying the right quantity of inventory is critical for success. This question can be answered with the cost of goods sold model. We must rearrange the cost of goods sold formula, then a store manager will know how much inventory to buy as shown in this presentation. Often a business must estimate the value of its goods. A fire may destroy the warehouse, all inventory, and all records. The insurance company requires an estimate of the loss. In this case, the business must estimate the cost of ending inventory because the records have been destroyed. The gross profit method, also known as the gross margin method, is widely used to estimate ending inventory. This method uses the familiar cost of goods sold model. For the gross profit method, we rearrange ending inventory and cost of goods sold as shown above. Finally, we want to analyze the effect of inventory errors. Inventory errors sometimes occur. When an error does occur in ending inventory, it creates errors for two accounting periods. In the table, we see the impact of overstated inventory is shown. Inventory errors counterbalance in two consecutive periods. Beginning inventory and ending inventory have opposite effects on cost of goods sold. Beginning inventory is added, ending inventory is subtracted. Therefore, after two periods, an inventory error washes out or counterbalances. However, if an inventory error happens at the end of our year and it materially misstates the ending inventory and cost of goods sold, it must be corrected through an adjusting entry in that current year. And so that concludes Chapter 6. Um, I hope that you found this interesting and that, that it was understandable. Uh, again, go back please and read the chapter closely. Um, pay attention to the key concepts that were covered in this presentation and then work through the learning exercises in the practical module. And um, I look forward to you when we start to review the information from Chapter 7. Thanks.